better redneck and eyes. Part of me really wants to watch Mama June from Hot to Not, and I used to watch Honey Boo Boo. Like, I think I watched the first two seasons, and then I stopped watching it. Maybe because I didn't have cable. Like, maybe I think that's why. Hey, guys, it's Wahima, but just call me Wah. Melanated! Well, welcome to my Love After Lockup recap. This is season two, episode 13. Sorry, not sorry. Okay, let's start off with Clint and Tracy. My goddess, Tracy! My favorite. <laughs> it is just a roller coaster ride of emotion for Clint, and I can absolutely see why Clint behaves the way he does. His parents, especially Alice, are enablers to the point where I think that they're low key scared of him. I don't know if Clint has had like a crazy amount of emotional issues, which in fact, I'm, I'm pretty sure he has. There is something that causes Alice to want to be firm with him, but then back up. She gets scared that she's gonna lose him. I don't understand why his parents, his well-to-do, put-together parents, don't just slap the shit out of Clint and tell him to get his shit together. They really are like, well now Clint, don't get upset, darling. And I'm like, why? What's he gonna do? I feel like Alice is really worried about what he's going to do to himself. She would be devastated if he hurt himself and it was because she wasn't the adoring parent or she wasn't supportive or something. I don't know, girl. But anyways, let's jump into this. So Clint goes to see his parents and they're having a little bit of a conversation about him before he walks into the room. But then he walks into the room and he says that the reason why he's going to see them is because they're about this close to disowning him if he stays with Tracy. But he's just like, no, I love Tracy. And if it came down to it, if I had to choose between Tracy or my parents, I would absolutely choose Tracy. You have known Tracy for a total of what, six, seven months? And within eight days of you meeting her out of prison, she gets arrested twice, but you would choose her over Alice? The woman who has done everything for you for the last 37 years? I mean, they're talking to Clint like he's not a grown ass man with his own house. So him and his parents sit down on the couch and they have a conversation about Tracy and Alice tries very hard to slap some sense into Clint. And the dad tries to talk and the dad is like, you know, we've never had to deal with any problems like this with you since you were 15 years old. And then my thought is like, what was happening before he was 15? Is that he just wasn't dating before that? Never had to deal with this whole situation with you and a prison person. I mean, she doesn't like prison, does she? And then Clint's like, I guess it doesn't bother her as much as it bothers me. And then Alice is like, you know she needs help, right? And then Clint's like, yeah, I believe she's starting to see that now. And then Alice goes on and says something that is just like ridiculous. Clint, you're a smart guy. There are plenty of women, good, uh, good looking Christian women. You could find you a good woman, Clint, who doesn't want to go out drinking and partying and, and Tracy doesn't want that. And Clint is like, but mama, I want Tracy. And we're just like, what the hell, Alice? Clint is not a smart guy. What decisions has he made in his life that would lead you to believe that he is a smart guy? Come on, Alice. We not buying that. Mama, she's been to rehab. Yes, Clint, she's been to rehab several times and it doesn't work. That's who she is, Clint, honey. Mama, people can change. Tracy can change. And then the dad is just like, okay, Clint, is there like a deal breaker? Is there anything that Tracy can do to make you just walk away from this whole situation? Is there any, any monetary amount that I could give you to make you walk away from this situation? And Clint is like, no, I already got me a new truck. If she comes out of jail and she doesn't quit her dragon ways, then I'm over it. Okay, so you mean that, Clint. You mean that you're gonna be over it. That is the hard line. Well, of course, I mean, of course we need to see because I don't know and um, girl, Clint does not know what he wants. Clint can't even say the word prison. He's like, cause she could have a change of heart during this situation while she's away and not here. And we're all like, Clint, you mean prison? She could have a change of heart while she is in prison this time. And Alice is like, She don't know what to do, so she starts to cry. And I know it has to break her husband's heart to see her cry. And how many nights has that man seen his wife cry over their dumbass son? I don't even know, girl. Like, it feels like that's Alice's boy and that's not his son. Because he is looking over at this, like, dry-faced, wrinkly-ass loser son. So the next scene with them, 
Clint walks out of the house to have a conversation with Tracy. Apparently Tracy calls him every single day and he is positive they're gonna make it. He told his family that she only had two, two and a half years worst case scenario. Tracy's on the phone telling him that she's looking at 20 years. 20 years y'all. So I don't know if that's true or not, but that's what she's saying to him. She's like, it could be 20 years. And he gets so upset, he hangs up on her and throws the phone. And at first we don't know why he's upset. So it turns out that he's actually upset with her because Tracy keeps saying things that make him believe that she wants to leave the relationship. But really what I think is happening is Tracy is offering him an out. And anytime he says anything, she's just like, well, you just want to break up then, don't you? And he's like, that's not what I'm saying. And he got upset and he hung up on her again, threw his phone again. This man has thrown this phone. I mean, what kind of otter case does he have on this phone? How much money does this man have that he could just pick up a phone and throw it? And I feel like it's an iPhone, which is an expensive phone. She is like, I feel like low-key paranoid that everybody in his life is telling him things about her. She asks him, she says, is your family asking you if I'm using you or are your friends saying stuff about me is your mother talking about me and Clint's like no my mom doesn't think that my mom is is so excited she loves you she just can't wait for you to get out and get healthy she wants you to be happy and healthy that's what my mom thinks and Tracy is just like why would I use you and and I didn't mean for this to happen and, and all this nonsense and he just can't handle it girl he gets upset Alice comes outside because Clint is like yeah! And she's like, Clint. And then he's like, she broke up with me, mama. You're happy now. Who broke up with you? Tracy, mama, Tracy broke up with me. And I guess now you're happy and, and everyone's happy and they're happy. Talking to the camera crew. And Alice, lie, I mean, this woman, she, I, she wants Clint to know that she is on his side regardless. She says, Clint, no, it's okay, honey. She'll call back. I promise. I thought we were team break up Tracy and Clint. And now all of a sudden you're promising him that she's going to call him back? Girl. Alice is sending so many mixed signals. It's crazy. I don't know whether to be on her side or to be like, you're the reason this is happening. You are the problem. So at the end of this segment, it looks like Clint and Tracy are broken up. And uh, I mean, while it was entertaining television, I'm just like, Clint is starting to wear on me with his shenanigans and stupidity. All right, so the next couple that we're gonna talk about is Brittany and Marcelino, and this is actually a really quick segment. It's cute. It starts off with them in the grocery store. Brittany's looking pregnant AF. I mean, she's looking like five, six months pregnant. They say she's about four months, and she says that she got pregnant immediately when she got out of prison. It's been four months since she's been out of prison, so I guess she's about four months. They're in the grocery store shopping for things, and Marcelino's having conversation with her that makes it seem like he's kind of in doubt about this whole pregnancy thing, and she's starting to feel like, you know, insecure about it, and they're having a level had a conversation though because I feel like a lot of people in Britney's place might be a little reactionary to the things that Marcelino is saying but she's just like no I need you to tell me whether or not you're in this I need somebody to love me and I want commitment and Marcelino's like commitment like he had never heard of the word and so it leaves on commercial leading us to believe that Marcelino doesn't know if he could be committed to Britney but I'm just like if you gonna recall back in episode one when Marcelino was outside of the prison talking to her, I'm like, this man is committed. You don't stand outside of a prison to have a phone conversation with somebody on the other side of the wall every day. Like what, what was he like spends three hours contacting her? I think Marcelino is in this to win it. He loves his little strawberry blonde thickums. He loves Brittany and I believe that. So I didn't believe that for one second. So then the next scene with them is they've gone to downtown Vegas because they're gonna have a date and Brittany's a little concerned Concern about their conversation from earlier, wondering if Marcelino can commit. They get out of the car and they're walking down the street and they have this moment with this magician and it's all a setup girl. Marcelino gets down on his knees and he proposes to her and gives her his grandmother's ring. It is so cute. I could not stop smiling that whole segment. And the other thing I thought was really cool is that the engagement box had a little light on the inside so that he could show her the ring at night and she'd be able to see the ring. Girl, I thought that was a magical touch, okay? Grandmama's ring, impromptu, like completely surprised her engagement. Like, I guess I always thought they were engaged already, but he got down on one knee in front of people and I was actually, it was really sweet and she was really surprised and really happy. I wish them only the best of luck. I really do think that Marcelino got the best convict out of everybody on this show. Obviously Brittany is the one that's the most level headed. She's a little sneaky. She was doing a little too much with Amanda, but I low key think that that was just for ratings. Like honestly, I think that Amanda and Brittany and Marcelino are smart enough to be able to orchestrate that thing. And they did it. They got enough screen time and so bravo to them.
bravo to them. And it looks like next episode, they're getting married. So like, they actually did it. And that's actually, I bow to them for that. Good job, you guys. Good job. All right, you guys, so let's talk about our next couple. Ooh, the thruple. Megan, not Markle, Sarah, and Michael. This episode was a cliffhanger. It was a good one, but they, again, they have been teasing this Megan Sarah showdown for four episodes. That is so long. They have been lying and teasing us for four episodes like we weren't gonna come back. Sharp, Matt Sharp. We're coming back every single week, so you don't need to tease us like that. You don't need to do that to us, bruh. We coming back. So this segment starts off with Sarah with her sunglasses on. I don't know if mama's been crying all night. So dry ass lipped Sarah goes and visits dry ass lipped Emmy and they have a conversation about Michael. And the entire time I thought, whose lips are gonna start bleeding first? I couldn't even watch them. Mainly because Sarah had those big ass weird ass sunglasses on that I just kept staring at her mouth. And then we went over to Emmy, I kept looking at her mouth and her eyebrows. And I was just like, what is happening? So Sarah gets to Emmy's house and Sarah tells Emmy, all the tea about what Michael has been doing with Megan. So Sarah finds Michael's phone and goes through it, girl, and sees all of the business. Sees the photos of Megan looking at wedding dresses. Sees naked videos of Megan masturbating. Sees her scantily clad. Knows about the trip to Niagara Falls. I mean, she knows everything. Also, because the PO came, stopped by the house to get the phone, and the PO had a female partner who made the PO low-key snitch on Michael and tell Sarah the circumstances around his arrest. So Sarah got all the tea and she came to tell her best Judy about it. Emmy, as soon as she found out what was going on, tried so hard not to smile. I mean, you could tell she was just ready to like giddy dance with glee because she just wants Sarah to break up with Michael so bad, but little does she know. I mean, honestly, I have no faith that Sarah's gonna actually break up with Michael. I think in the back of her mind, she's got some dumb fairy tale about him being her baby daddy. And so she still needs to try to make it work with him because of whatever. But the thing is though, like, and excuse my French, but Michael is an ain't shit ass nigga and he, he ain't worth nobody's time. Nobody's time. He's only worth the time of a person who doesn't have any self-esteem. Michael is not gonna get right until he's like 45, 60 years old. He's one of them cats that just gonna keep doing, keep having kids, keep going in and out of jail. Like he has no emotional frame of reference to being a normal human being. He is like, he's just gonna consistently and constantly let down the people in his life and specifically and especially the women in his life. He's gonna continue to break his mother's heart. He's gonna continue to break whoever, the girlfriend's heart, cause he's a liar and doesn't know what he wants. And it's just like pathological, right? Like it, it just is what it is. There's gonna be no good woman that changes him. Michael's gonna have to do that for himself. And you can absolutely tell that's what's gonna go on due to the way that he's handled this entire situation especially when he's having a conversation with Sarah. I mean, he's caught. Miraculously, Michael calls Sarah at the exact same time that she is A, being filmed, and B, with Emmy. So, he gets put on speakerphone. Sarah's excited. She's like, ooh, I'm about to have this conversation. She goes into her black scent, you know what I'm saying? The spirit of her non-black ancestors just like come in through her body. And she's like, Michael, answer me something real quick. And he's like, what? And she's like, did you or did you not bring Megan to Niagara Falls and have sex with her? And Michael's like, why you asking all these questions? Michael talk like, he, the slower he speaks, the better his lies will be. Why you saying all of this? Tell me the truth. I'm trying to figure out why you saying all of this. Michael, I'm not dumb. She's your other woman. Tell me the truth, Michael. Do you love me or do you love Megan? I don't have time to be asking all these weak ass questions. Pause. If a motherfucker told me that a question that I have about his integrity and our relationship is a weak ass question. What? Who the fuck is you talking to? You the one weak ass going back to jail on some bullshit violation. So you gonna tell me that the questions I'm asking you about our relationships is weak? Motherfucker, what? Listen, I mean, look, girl, ha, ha, wouldn't be me. I swear for God, it wouldn't be me. Come on, answer the question.
question for me. Why you keep saying this? Keep playing me. You better answer my questions. I'm stronger than you think. You love Megan? Didn't you already ask me that? Pause. Didn't you already ask me that? Yeah, I did, stupid, but you didn't answer it. So can you answer it? I don't have time to be answering no questions like this on the phone. Pause. Mm -hmm. My man. Nah, nah. Motherfucker. You have nothing but time, actually. You literally have two months worth of time. Nay, three months worth of time. What do you mean you don't have time? So what, what do you have time for? You know what? I promise you, if you don't answer these questions, I'm done, Michael. I'm done. I'm not doing this anymore. I'm over this. I'm not calling you. I'm not answering any phone calls if you don't answer these questions. I don't have time to be answering these kinds of questions on the phone. My promise stands. I'm pregnant again. What? Pregnant? Now, this is where I call BS because that didn't sound convincing at all. I feel like he knew she was pregnant. Michael, I promise you, I will find a way to get a divorce. I'm not doing this anymore. And then Amy snatches the phone and hangs up, girl. It is so much. Amy is just gleeful. And Amy is so happy all within her chakras. Her chakras are aligned, her body is ready. You know what I'm saying? Amy is over this entire situation. She is so happy to see Michael dig himself into a hole. And she's like, come on, Sarah, it'll be fine. Don't need to worry about it. Just worry about the future and blah, blah, blah. And Sarah's like, no, it's not going to be fine. I have been defending this man for years and he has made me look absolutely stupid. I need somebody to help me. And I'm like, girl, help you do what? Amy been trying to help you for so long and you have not been listening to her. Everyone has been trying to help you for so long and you've not been listening to anybody. So you're just gonna have to take this L, sis. Megan P.S. is at the hotel still looking for jobs, still trying to figure out how to find a place there to live because she's like, look, if he's gone back to jail for three more months, I might as well just stay here, get established. That way when he gets out of prison, I can have a home for him to come back to. And then she's like, oh, he says he really likes my eyes. I'm gonna go visit him. So I'm gonna pick out my prison outfit and I'm also gonna put my makeup on, make sure my eyes look really pretty. And so she's getting ready, girl. The next scene with them is Sarah is on her way to meet Megan. A producer is in the car with her when she's on her way to see Megan, feeding her lines or asking her things so that we can get sound bites of her reaction. So part of her reaction is she wants Megan to know that she's the wife and not a baby mama. And so Megan then needs to default to her and just take a step back regardless of the situation. She has a feeling that Megan doesn't know who she is, but she still kind of calls bullshit because she says that Megan absolutely knows that he has a daughter. So obviously there must be some other person involved. And I'm just like, Sarah girl, no. There are a lot of men who have kids and don't care at all for their baby mom or don't be with their baby mom or it was an accident and they're just like platonically doing whatever. So, I mean, even if you guys were still messing around, there is no way for Megan to know that you are his wife. That is gonna be a crazy thing for her to find out because she has been looking for wedding dresses and you know that. Also, Sarah starts to talk about what's gonna happen if they fight and she's just like, if I get into a fight, it's because I have lost all like composure and sense of self. So she's like saying she's not trying to fight with her, but she is going there with aggression, let's be honest. Like she really wants to stake her claim on Michael and be the one that's hurting the most. Meanwhile, she doesn't know that Megan has been talking to Michael for three years, I mean two years, right? So yes, she has more of a claim on Michael because she knew Michael for six years and has his kid and is pregnant with the second kid. But Megan still has a legitimate claim, I think. Emotionally, she's been talking and writing letters to this person for two years. That's a long time. You know, she thinks she's engaged to Michael. It sucks that she's only been able to see him, what, for two days. For her, that's enough for her to move her ass to Rochester, wherever they are, and try to figure out life there. So anyways, it ends on a cliffhanger of Megan and Sarah sitting down together, but they kind of pose it to Megan like, you can meet with Sarah if you want to, but um, you know, only if you want to. Meanwhile, Sarah is on her way, girl. And we're gonna see what happens in the next episode. And I have a feeling it's gonna be good. And the way Sarah came at her was like, so what do you think I am? I would have been like, white what do you mean what do i think you are you are a woman i would have been mad confused with that question for coming at me with all kinds of attitude for no reason no girl i don't play that so the next couple that we're going to talk about is caitlin and matt so we pick up it's about like a couple hours after the funeral home caitlin says something like 
Matt just threw her by the wayside and took off. I'm not sure what that means, but anyway, she's staying at a hotel, girl, because she just like can't even deal with it. She's still heavily grieving. She gets into her hotel room. She lays on the bed. She's pissed off at the blankets. She's pissed off at the pillows, girl. She is just pissed off at everybody. And then three pizza boxes later, we get back to her. She's in the room. She's got coffee cups everywhere. She got clothes everywhere. It's been a couple of hours and she has been going through it. She calls Matt. Matt doesn't pick up. She leaves a voicemail and throws the phone on the ground. Everybody throwing their phone. I don't get why. But a couple hours later, she's stewing in her grief and she gets a phone call and it's from some county jail because Matt is in prison for having or being in or something with a stolen vehicle, girl. Matt is not with her for less than 24 hours. And he just bugs out. I know meth was involved. I don't believe for one second he got into a stolen vehicle completely sober. Regardless if he stole it or not, he could have been with a friend, another method. So she answers the phone and she's like, where are you? He's like, I'm in jail. She's like, great. And then he starts to like tell her something like, oh, um, these dudes think they're playing games or these guys are really trying to play games here. Nobody thinks this is a game but you. You're the only person that thinks this is a game. And she goes off on him. She's like, you don't know what it's like to be me. You just get to sit in prison and do whatever, but it's hard on me. It's hard on the people that are around you. And he's like, oh, okay, I gotta go. She's like, yeah, I gotta go too. I'm not gonna answer the phone, bye. She hangs up, she's just pissed. Girl, I, I mean, my heart just goes out to her. Matt is a, I just, why can't she see that he is a top tier, grade A, nothing, nobody fuck up? Like, maybe that's what it is. Maybe it's that she just really wants to be the person who doesn't think that about him and that she wants to be the good person, the bigger person, the person who loves him throughout whatever. And I'm just like, your sanity isn't worth this. Your time and your money is not worth this person who can't even properly help you get through your mother's passing. And no fault of his own. I mean, yeah, fault of his own for sure. But like Matt is, you have to think about Matt as being like somebody with a disability, emotional disability, right? It's just a, a, a d unable, non-able, unable to emotionally help you because he has been doing drugs since he was a teenager. And that physically, that changes you. It changes how you learn to cope with things. It changes how you take in information. When you don't have that kind of healthy, like normal way of figuring out how to manage your emotions at such a young age, like there's no real coming back from that. People do come back from that, but like only people who really want help. And Matt sees himself as an outlaw. So like at 28, he still sees himself as an outlaw, as somebody who was never gonna be a productive member of society. So he was never gonna be that for her. I just feel bad. So the next couple that we're gonna talk about is Lizzie and Scott. This was a really confusing one. The first thing I wanna know is what is prison pie and what is all in it? I've been trying to do some detective work and figure it out. I didn't Google it yet, but I will Google it. In fact, I'm gonna Google it right now. Nope, this is all not stuff. That's helpful. Okay, anyway, so it looks like it has Reese's Pieces peanut butter cups. I saw some Hershey chocolate on there. I thought, thought I saw three giant bottles of like powdered creamer, but I don't know what that is. And then she was, in order to make the frosting, scraping the inside of Oreo cookies into a bowl. So the frosting has to do with whatever's on the inside of Oreo cookies. I wonder what they do with the Oreo cookies. Maybe they crunch them up. Maybe that is the crust. I couldn't figure it out, but I want to. If anybody knows what prison pie is or the recipe, please leave it down below. They're in the hotel room. They're still at that hotel. It's been, what, two weeks? It's the next day after she had her $2,000 shopping spree with Mel, which she hasn't told him about. So I guess she's trying to make this pie for him to butter him up to give him that information. And she's like, so what did you do today? And he's like, I just stayed here, you know, and waited for you. And she's like, you just, you just been waiting for me? You didn't do anything else the whole day? And he's like, no, okay. Well, you know that I have to spend time with my daughter and that she doesn't like you and that I'm really trying to get her to like you. So that's what I've been doing. So I'm, I'm sorry that we haven't been able to spend much time together, but that's what's going on. I think that she's playing a very like manipulative game with Scott where she wants to let him know that she's giving up her time with Jasmine 
to be with him. Not giving up her time, but that she's trying to balance her time with Jasmine. So while he might be a little frustrated and upset that she's not spending a uh, extra crazy amount of time with him, she just wants him to know the reason why is because she's with her daughter. And she has to be because her daughter's kind of mad at her right now. And Jasmine also doesn't like Scott. And she tells him, you know, she doesn't like you, which to me is so rude. Why would you tell him that? He already knows. You don't have to reiterate it. And so I got to spend time with her because I need her to know that you're a good guy. And so that's what I'm working on. But I'm here and we're going to make pie together and we're going to like hang out. <laughs> And then he's like, well, I'm gonna, if that's the case, I'll just leave tomorrow if that's what's gonna make it better. And he's like, all of a sudden, like very defeatist and sad and being weird. And he tells us in the confessional that it's because he's worried about having to tell her that he's broke. So he is being a little elusive and weird, but he's also trying to like make her feel bad about something. Does this work? I'm just gonna tell you. I'm not looking down for anything. I'm gonna cry. That is literally what Scott's teeth look like. Scott's teeth are about two seconds from flying out of his mouth. I'll leave tomorrow and you can stay with Jasmine the whole time. I don't care, fine, I'll leave. I've waited three years, what's another year to wait? And Lizzie is like, what do you mean wait? Wait for what? And then he just doesn't tell her. Like, Scott doesn't want to tell Lizzie anything. He doesn't want to tell her how he feels about them not having sex. He doesn't want to tell her about the money problems. Like he doesn't want to tell her about all the attention that he requires and that he wants from her because he's deathly worried that she's going to leave him because he thinks that she is the moon and the stars. And she's playing a game where she's just wanting to set up boundaries, but not totally kick him out of her life and not totally make him mad so that he goes anywhere because she does need him. He is her cash cow. So they're both playing this like really fine, weird game. What do you mean that you can wait longer? Is it because of the sex? And he's like, well, you know, you said you didn't want to have sex. And she's like, okay, the sex conversation. Cool. And he's like, no, no, it's not the sex. I don't care about the sex. And she's like, are you sure you don't care about the sex? And he's like, I don't care about the sex. And she's like, well, you're not looking at me when you say that. I don't care about the sex. I mean, just back and forth. It's just, I can't even explain to you guys really what their conversation was about because it was all about nothing. Because he doesn't want to tell her what he's really shaking in the boots about. And she's just taking advantage of this whole situation. All of a sudden, all of her pie, you know, confections are put away and we don't get to see what's in prison pie. And she's like, fine, then I'm leaving. And so then she, she leaves and the crew follows her. And then out in the hallway, she starts to tell the crew about how, why she's mad. And she says that she's mad because he isn't talking to her and that he's, you know, hiding something. And he's like looking down, his eyes are doing this weird thing. He follows out of the door behind them and he hears her confessing about his eyes and her being mad. And then he takes that opportunity to get even more upset and say that he's never, she's said, she, I don't even know, girl. <laughs> What are, they, what are they arguing about? Lizzie at this point doesn't know either. And it's weird because she looks like a deer in headlights when he confronts her. And he's, she looks at the camera and she looks at him and she's like, what are you talking about? And he's like, I've never been mad at you. How dare you be mad at me? And he's like, you could cuss at me. You could call me names. You could do whatever. And I would never be mad at you. And she's like, when did I ever cuss? What are you what are you talking about? And then she does that thing where she's like low-key gaslighting him where she's like, you're being crazy. And that makes him upset. He's like, that right there. And she's like, that right there, what? Like, tell me what it is that you are upset. And frankly, she's a user, but like, I don't get what he's doing. Do you guys get somebody down below tell me what Scott's doing? Because I don't get it. I really don't. I don't know why he's upset. Besides the fact that he's harboring a secret, but why is it coming out that way? Why is it coming out to where it makes no sense? He deserves everything that comes his way, frankly. He is an idiot, and I don't feel any sorry for him at all. Not at all. It's like if <laughs> They're arguing about who's looking down. Well, you're looking down. Well, you look down. No, you look down first when I was talking to you. So you can look down, but I can't look down. Just like, what? Scott says that he thought them being engaged would make them closer. And I'm like, do you remember that yes? That like, okay, yes, that she said. And you thought that it would make you guys closer. 
I think he's just really interested in proving that he isn't a trick. And the truth is, is that he absolutely is. So anyways, you guys, that is the end of this episode. Thank you guys so much for rocking with me. This was a good episode. I really enjoyed it. Top notch. Now, the next week's episode is a two hour event and I feel like that bears some kind of celebration. I don't know what I'm gonna do. Am I gonna be in LA? No, I'll be home. Anyways, two hour event, girl. Let's have a kiki and a conversation in the comment section. Let me know what you guys thought of this episode. And oh my God, girl. Follow me on Instagram if you're not already following me on Instagram. I'm doing keto and other things. I'm doing a yoga challenge that's Yoga with Adrienne, 30 days dedicate. So I put that on Instagram as well. I'm actually gonna do yoga tonight, girl. I missed it today, but it's gonna happen. It's gonna happen, I promise you. All right, you guys, remember to be you, be true, and find your place. Bye.